So I'm using my iPad today. Um, so if it doesn't all work right, that's, you know, that's the way it goes. Um, uh, today we're talking you know, pretty much about trade, growth, and prosperity. Uh, it's, you know, it's constantly in the news, so you know, it's, it was a big topic. Uh, we decided on this a long time ago, and uh, the only thing I did forecast was that the president was going to do this stuff. And so we, we organized this, this today. Uh, some special thanks. I'd like to thank, uh, as, as uh, Chancellor Yang mentioned, David Marshall, who, who helps us out at the Forecast Project. Uh, uh, Eric Sonquist, who uh, he's the CFO of the UCSB Foundation. He's been with the Forecast Project for a long time and, and helps us. Thanks to all the sponsors. Susan Yamashiro, she's the one that sets everything up for us. Uh, my two graduate students, Christine Braun and, and Travis uh, Saronic. Uh, they're my students, PhD students at UCSB, and they work at the Forecast Project, and of course our, our board of directors, so thanks. Um, <clears throat> okay, so anybody in the audience, if you want to download the talk that I'm going to give today, the slides, uh, this is where you do it. Um, so it's um, basically here. See? It's basically there. Um, you, just, you can get that on your phone, and you can... Uh, Keep these. Um, th that link is going to be uh, around for a while. We did a, a, something a few weeks ago on the disasters, uh, the, the fires and, and debris flow. Uh, so I'm not going to talk much about that today, but here's a link to that if you want it. And uh, we also do something thanks to um, Montecito Bank and Trust and Tom Parker at Hutton Parker. Um, we started this thing called the Community Indicators Project, which is <clears throat> different than the economics part. We're talking about the health uh, of what's going on in Santa Barbara. <clears throat> So let me tell you about the agenda today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the good, which is GDP growth, low unemployment um, uh, you know, in the US and, and, and around our uh, area. I'll talk about the bad. The bad is it turns out Santa Barbara is really not keeping pace with uh, our surrounding counties in the US, uh, which is bad. Uh, and then the ugly, the good, the bad, the ugly. The ugly is impending tariffs and international trade, uh, a trade war. And I'm going to start out with the ugly, just to get the ugly out of the way. Um, so what I'm going to do, and I feel kind of, I don't know, bad about this, but um, none of you remember your economics when you were in school because you were just trying to study to get a grade. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about international trade. I'm going to talk a little bit about what it means and about why almost every economist believes international trade is good. So it's like Econ 101, just for five, ten minutes, and I'll, I'll tell you why I'm going to do that. Um, so what's dominated the headlines? Obviously, tariffs, protectionism. Uh, Trump has announced that he wanted to put uh, tariffs on washing machines, aluminum, and WTF does not stand for wine this Friday. <clears throat> <laughs> so let me do something really nerdy for a second. Um, if you go to the United States International Trade Commission, that's here. Um, and what I'm going to do is, where it says nothing, Oops. I'm going to type in, just for fun, aluminum. Now, when I say aluminum, you're going to think to yourselves, well, that's just aluminum, isn't there? Well, it turns out, because we don't have free trade, that people who are, are in the aluminum business and want to fight against the rest of the world who are competing with them, I want to show you what this looks like. And we have to hire people in the United States, by the way, and in other countries to do this. So I typed in aluminum. Well, what kinds of aluminum are there? Aluminum chloride, aluminum sulfate, iron non-alloy steel, aluminum alloys with 25% or more weight of silicon, aluminum blah, blah, blah. Here's more aluminum. Aluminum wire with a maximum cross-sectional dimension of seven millimeters. And then there's one for less than seven millimeters. Somebody has to be deciding on the millimeters, people. Do you understand this? People are there, that's their job. And why do they do it? It's because someone who has greater or less than seven millimeters are facing competition in the world. And they feel they can't compete. Just like Harley Davidson did back in the 80s. And they put tariffs on big motorcycles because that's all Harley made. So let's, you know, you can keep going down and keep going down. And it's, it's crazy, right? I mean, so let's go to one of our favorites. Let's go to aluminum foil. Aluminum foil with a thickness 0 0.01 millimeters, rolled, but not further worked, and not backed. That's the one I'm going to look at. So let's, whoops. So we're going to click on that. And then 
I'm going to look at detail. So now this is what you get. So it turns out, as you can see here, um, what this says is we imported $203 million of this type of aluminum foil. Okay? Now, if you look here, this says that our most favored nation's rate is 5.8%. That means that any aluminum foil that's imported, we're paying a higher price than the rest of the world because we have tariffs on it. This is, these are our countries that have most favored nation status. And by the way, um, down here are countries we hate. <laughs> countries we hate, we, f we force them not to trade with us because we put a 40% tariff on aluminum foil from countries that we're fighting against that we don't like. Unless, of course, now we have to get into what Roberto is going to talk about in Jorge, unless, of course, you have been clever enough to have bilateral agreements with the United States. For example, the Caribbean Basin Initiative, uh, the Caribbean Basin Trade Partnership Act, the Morocco Partnership Act, Jordan, Singapore. Now somebody has to go out and negotiate with all these countries bilaterally to make sure that they're our friends. That's a lot of wasted time and people's effort. I mean, maybe we want them to be doing that, but, you know, I don't, I don't think so. So anyway, you can do this for any product, by the way. And you will see soon that we're not very open to trade at all. We pay, tax, we pay higher tariffs on sugar. Many of you don't know that we're paying about twice the world price for sugar. And the reason is when you're in the market and you get sugar, it doesn't even, right, it's like $2 or something. You don't notice it. But we're paying more just because of these tariffs. And it's, you know, it, it, it hurts our... Uh, uh, economy for sure. Okay, so, whoops. Okay, will this save jobs? And the answer is no. It, it's going to save some jobs, of course. And just like maybe you might remember. In 1930, the Republican controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression passed the, anyone, anyone, a tariff bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? <clears throat> that was Ben Stein, right? Um, Herbert Stein's kid, you know, he's a good guy. But, you know, what this basically was, this was during the Great Depression. Lots of things were happening. Businesses couldn't sell their products because of the Great Depression. And many businesses went to, the, uh, to Hoover and basically said, we need tariffs. And in fact, he signed a bill that increased tariffs on 900 different products. And if you read this little thing, it says the, uh, one of the partners at J.P. Morgan said, I almost went down on my knees to beg Herbert Hoover to veto the asinine Holly Smoot Tariff Act, which intensified nationalism and protectionism around the world. So what we're seeing today isn't, isn't new. Um, the reason it's more important today, by the way, than it was back then, and I don't believe that the tariffs back then made the Great Depression very uh, much worse, and the reason is, if you look and see that um, uh, uh, back in, in the early 1929-1930, trade you know, was only about 7%, it went down to about 3%, but a very, very small part of GDP. This is total trade, this is the sum of exports and imports. Today, you can see, it's about 30% of, of uh, uh, our GDP comes from trade, both imports and exports. So now it's a big deal in our economy. And putting tariffs and increasing the cost of goods, you know, is going to be bad for us because it's just now so big. So what's the reason? The reason is, and, you know, maybe you think that Trump won the election because he said he wanted to increase manufacturing jobs. This is a picture going back to 1840. Now, you know, I would ask uh, President Trump, why stop at manufacturing jobs? In the, in the whole history of the world, it's never been more than 30% of employment. Why don't we bring back agricultural jobs? Look, 70%. Don't remember how good it was to shovel manure all, all day? Don't you want to do that again? No. And manufacturing, you can see services has just taken off. And that happens in every economy when they grow. You move from agriculture to manufacturing, typically, and then to services. 
So that's just a normal phenomenon, and trade and protectionism doesn't, doesn't save jobs. <clears throat> so a couple of quick myths. Protectionism saves jobs. And I say here it may save some jobs, and the way it's going to work is if he does do this steel thing, he's going to go to the steel plant, and he's going to say, look, I saved these 500 jobs at this plant, and everybody's going to clap. However, what you don't count are all the people who lost their jobs because prices went up of steel and they couldn't produce the goods they were producing before. Those are much harder to measure. And just to explain what, <coughs> what is going on here, whoops, this is, um, oops, sorry about that. This happens when you do stuff live, but. <clears throat> this is a plant in Austria, and this plant in Austria back in the 60s and 70s, they made 500 tons of steel wire with over 1,000 workers. Today, they make 500 tons of steel wire, a better brand of steel wire, with 14 jobs, 14 employees in this plant. It has nothing to do with international trade. It has everything to do with technology, and that's what happened. Technology drove those, uh, uh, those workers out, not not uh, international trade, and that happens everywhere, right? So, um, you know, that's what we have to be aware of. The second one is exports are good, and you hear this all the time from politicians. Exports are good, we need to export more, and imports are bad. So, Trump's top trade guy, Peter Navarro, maybe you've heard of him, he's the top trade guy. He's from UC Irvine. Don't send your kids to UC Irvine. <laughs> Don't. Send them, to, send them here, home, where they learn good stuff. He doesn't get it. And you know what? In, in the next five minutes, I'm going to teach you more than he has ever known about international trade. <clears throat> here it goes. And you learned this in, in college, but you forgot it. It all has to do with comparative advantage and specialization. That's where, that's where it's at. That's what every person, every economist really knows about. What you do is you produce the relatively cheap good, and then you trade for the goods that you want to consume. By the way, today I'm, gonna, I'm talking now, and then we're going to have some other people talk, I'm gonna talk. There's going to be some audience participation. I want anyone or everyone to do the following, if you can. Take an article of clothing that you have, like a jacket, look inside. Go ahead. Look inside. Take up your purse, anything you want. Just look at it and tell me where it was made. Where? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was made by Brooks Brothers, sure. <laughs> In their Chinese factory. What you're going to see is every piece of clothing that's out there, I can almost guarantee you 99% of them were not made in the United States. They haven't been for a long time. We're not good, relatively good at making clothes. Why? It's labor's expensive. And making clothes turns out to be labor intensive. So what you want to do is, here's another one. I could. Did you make that shirt? Did you? Why not? OK, you could learn to sew and do all that kind of stuff. It's too costly. Each and every one of us could make all of our own clothes. We could make all of our own food, right? You could build your own car. You could do all this stuff. Why don't you do it? You don't because you don't have the know-how. And what you do is you do your stuff. You work in a bank. You work in a manufacturing, whatever, to make money to buy the goods that are easier for other people to make. That individual example is the same as international trade. Let me give you just a quick example. <clears throat> here are two countries, the United States and Peru. What I have here is that basically um, uh, this is the number of things that can be made in a day if you use all your resources. So for example, in the United States, if they, in a one day, they could produce 150 shirts. Or if they wanted to produce apps, software apps, they could produce 100. And look at poor Peru. Right? They can only make 60 shirts in a day, or they could make um, 20 uh, apps. So you might say to yourself, well, why do we need Peru? We don't need Peru. That's ridiculous. We're so much better at everything. What that doesn't get the heart of is what's called opportunity cost and comparative advantage. For every shirt that per, uh, Peru produces, they give up a third of an app. They can't produce a third of an app because they're producing um, shirts in the US. We give up two-thirds of an app if we produce shirts. So what that tells you right there is Peru has a comparative advantage. They can make shirts cheaper than the United States. 
and vice versa, <clears throat> and vice versa the U.S. can produce um, apps at a lower cost than Peru. So what do you do? <clears throat> well, it turns out the world price out there, and I'm going to put a world, world price, of one half app for one shirt. So you go to the marketplace, you can trade one shirt for one half an app. What I mean by that is that the price is going to be somewhere between this one-third and two-thirds. That's where the price is going to be in the, in the world price. Okay, so now um, let's focus on Peru. <clears throat> so here's Peru again. So now what Peru's going to do is they're going to specialize. They're going to specialize in the good in which they can produce most cheaply. That's shirts. And then, then what they're going to do is they're going to trade on the world market for apps because they want to have apps. Right? So what they're going to do is specialize. They're going to produce all 60, they're going to produce 60 shirts. And now what does that do? What that does is once they produce the 60 shirts up here, once they produce 60, they can trade on the world market and get 30 apps instead of 20 if they did it themselves. That's the whole nature of international trade. That's why we do it. Now, what happens if there's a tariff? You put a tariff on, and all it does, it brings this line closer and closer to what's called autarky, where we end up having to produce it ourselves. You make the tariff high enough, per Peru only gets 20 apps instead of 30. What that little example that tells you is we are richer because of international trade. What do I mean by richer? With your money, with your hours of work, you can now buy 30 apps instead of 20. So if you only wanted 20, you've got money left over. So trade has made everybody richer, and there's just no doubt about it. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's go back to our friend Peter Navarro. <clears throat> You're not here, are you? <clears throat> so here's Navarro's big mistake. <clears throat> And by the way, you can Google it, and there's hundreds of articles about how stupid he is. Um, <laughs> about this issue. I don't, know, I don't know him, you know, about this issue, that's all. Um, so there's a class at Irvine called Bad Trade Accounting 101. <laughs> don't take that class. Um, here's what we, you learn in, 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 in college. Output is consumption plus investment plus government spending plus exports minus imports. Why is it measured like that? Gross domestic product is how much stuff we produce within the borders of the United States. That's what gross domestic product is. When we export something, it was produced in the United States, so we want to count it as GDP. If we import something, it was not produced in the United States, we don't want to count it. So that's why it enters this equation with, an, with a negative sign. <clears throat> and this is what Navarro said. See, look, people, when we export, when we export GDP goes up. <clears throat> And when we import, because it goes in with a negative sign, GDP goes down. That's really stupid. Why is it stupid? When we import a bottle of French wine for $20, guess what? We drink it. We drink it. That's C. That's consumption. What that means is, is that for every $20 we import and we consume it, C enters with a positive sign, imports with a negative, it, it, it balances out. It's zero. Imports add zero to GDP. It's not negative, it's zero. <clears throat> Example, suppose we import three billion more. So now we have a trade deficit. We're importing three billion more, and people tell you that's bad. And we export one billion more. So according to Navarro, this would be a horrible thing. What happens to G overall GDP? Come on, do the math. Import three, million, uh, three billion more and export one billion more. What happens? GDP goes up by a billion, even though we imported three billion more, because it cancels out. And Navarro has a book out there called Death by China, where he makes this mistake over and over and over again. So now you know more than, than he. <laughs> Pretty simple. OK, I promised to talk about the good and then the bad. I already talked about the ugly. Um, so as everyone knows, since coming out of the Great Recession, things have been quite slow. Um, actually very slow, and um, I want to start a little bit talking about output and income. And this is a picture of real GDP going back to 1929. Uh, you can see the Great Recession here. You can see uh, World War II, so you see the Great Recession. You see us growing throughout World War II. And then pretty much we just stayed along this trend line, which basically says that we grow at about 2 to 3% a year on average. Um, and if it's per capita, it's about 1.5% per year. And that's what this red straight line means. Lately, however, we've been off target a little bit, off this trend. 
So that's up here after the Great Recession. We really have sort of seemed to uh, veer away from our, our long run trend, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, as we go. So remember this, little, this picture here at the end. When I said we're doing, uh, growing very slowly, this is a picture of our gross domestic product in real terms, getting rid of inflation. And what I've done is I have put everybody at um, uh, equal to one at the beginning of the uh, expansion, that is just at the trough, is here, everybody's at one. And then I've looked at all of the recessions going back to 1960, and I look how we grow coming out of, the, out of a recession. And the interesting thing to see here is that this gold, this sort of thicker gold line, is our current recovery. It's the slowest we've ever had, basically, in, um, you know, in our history. So that just tells us, right, that's, that something maybe is going on. Um, the other thing that's interesting to look at here, by the way, is that you know, we're now you know, 36 quarters past the trough, and you can see many times what's happened is that, in, um, you know, for example, in the 2001 cycle, by this time we were already back in a recession, right? So we went 2001 and then 2008 we, got, you know, we entered the recession. Um, and you can see this gold line is just kind of solidly growing and it has been for a long time, right? So it's been a bit slow. So now here's what I've done. I've taken every MSA in the United States and I've looked at their growth over 2015 to 20, through 2016. So for MSAs, the latest data we can get is actually 2016. Um, here is Santa Barbara, right? That's, here is zero. So we've had negative growth in 2016. 2016 was not a very good year for Santa Barbara. Uh, the gold here is Ventura. This is Ventura here. And you can't see um, uh, uh, um, San Luis Obispo, which is here, but basically had almost zero growth. So you can see we're way far down on, the, on sort of not such good growth here uh, in our area. If we look at the growth in, uh, in some of our uh, industries, so for example, government, which adds the most amount to GDP in, in Santa Barbara County, 16% uh, of all of the, uh, or 17% of uh, GDP comes from government, so it grew a little bit. Financial activities, which add the next largest um, to GDP, have fallen. And they've fallen by, you know, close to almost 4% in terms of GDP. So that sector of the economy is not doing well at all. Information technology is way down here, also not doing well. Um, education, health services have, et cetera. So you can see that sort of not everyone's growing. There are some uh, areas in the economy that are, uh, in our local economy that are falling, some growing, so it's a bit mixed. And so I mentioned that little divergence from, from GDP, um, and th that is troubling, and many people have commented on this, and uh, I'm going to comment on somebody's comment. Uh, and this is Larry Summers. So you guys know Larry Summers. Larry Summer, Summers was the former um, Treasury Secretary and President of Harvard, very famous economist. Uh, he brought up this term, secular stagnation, which was actually invented in 1935 by Alvin Hansen. And what it basically says is, um, We've already invented everything and we're never going to grow again. That's secular stagnation. And a bunch of people have jumped on this bandwagon saying, you know, something's really wrong. Um, but the point is that, you know, it, it's, they think it that way. But if you look at the stock market, the stock market doesn't believe that, right? Um, uh, how, businesses and households don't believe that. Um, returns on investment are very solid. And this is where, this is a bit subtle, by the way, but. Um, you can read this thing. I, I wrote it, by the way. But um, this is that. Um, this comes from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and I, I wrote it with a guy, a guy who's there and another friend of mine. And let me tell you what it is they're looking at when they say things are really bad and there are no investment opportunities. This is the thing they look at: is this picture. So this is a picture Larry Summers has brought up before. And what this is: these are real returns to Treasury Secretary uh, Treasury uh, Securities. And what you can see is: so these are inflation uh, adjusted. And basically, you can see that you know, throughout the 80s and 90s and 2000, you know, we were somewhere you know, close to uh, 3 to 4% in terms of real terms. That was the, re the returns on these uh, securities. And you can see as we go into 2010, um, after the Great Recession, you know, these things became negative. And now they're still kind of negative. And what they're saying is, this is partly what the, if the Fed believes. They call it our star. It's where should the, the, the interest rate be? And the point is that if you're a business person trying to think about investment, you don't look at that thing. What you look at is the returns to capital. 
And that's where our paper comes in. This paper basically says, look, go into the national income and product accounts and calculate all the income generated from capital. So we look at you know, returns to rents, we look at returns to um, uh, uh, income, all those kinds of things, and we add all that up, divided by the capital stock, and these are the returns we get. We have, this is for just business, all means uh, including housing. So if you look at um, after-tax returns for, for everything, you know, it's somewhere around 5%, but what you can see is it hasn't declined. If anything, it's starting to rise after the Great Recession. So these are real returns. That is what you get if you invest a dollar in a unit of capital as a business. And these things have not been declining. Um, and again, it comes just directly from the national income and product accounts from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And, business, and households are also healthy. So here's a few pictures just to show that, you know, what happened over time and what's happening lately. So as you can see, these are checkable deposits for non-financial corporate business. So what's been happening over time, right, is that these businesses, you know, were holding less and less cash, um, less and less deposits. Everything was out there working somehow, mostly levered. And then we hit the Great Recession. Um, we ha it was an all-time low for amount of checkable deposits and, and currency in, in the business sector. And then, I guess, they figured out, hey, that's bad. You know, after the Great Recession, maybe we should do something. So now, they're healthier. You can see there's money sitting there. They're not, you know, overly levered. And I can show you in, in different ways. This is the net worth of non-financial corporates, going back to 1947. So what you can see here is, up here, we are almost the highest we've ever been in the history of the United States. That says businesses are as healthy as they've ever been in terms of net worth. Now, <clears throat> how about households? Households look kind of identical in terms of checkables and deposits. Again, they, you know, everything was out. They didn't have much in the, sitting in bank accounts. Hit the Great Recession. Things come back a little bit. <clears throat> this is leverage. These are liabilities to um, uh, disposable income. And you can see that in 2005, we were about at 1.3 times um, income. So many, very highly levered in, in this particular case. After the Great Recession, we've come down. We're closer to one now. Still fairly highly levered, but you know, um, a lot less than we were back in 2005. This is net worth of households. Households today are the richest they've ever been in the history of the United States that we have good data for, going back to 1947. Guys, you're rich. That's what this says. You're supposed to be happy. You're supposed to be buying things and doing stuff, right? You're really rich. And it's not all housing, by the way. I have other graphs about showing that it's not just housing wealth um, and, and stock market wealth. So, you know, so right now, sort of the net worth, it's, it looks very, very good. You can see what happened during the Great Recession. Net worth fell from, you know, uh, over four and a half to, uh, uh, to about three and a half. So, you know, that was a big shock to net worth. But now we're back, and again, it's, you know, that's a healthy sign. So, so that argument, secular stagnation, I say it's stupid. You know, you can use your own words for it. You know, I, I believe that, as Megan was saying, you know, we have lots of opportunities out there, technological progress. One of my main things that I'm working on now, basically, is that I think a lot of the stuff we're seeing in the data is due to economic mismeasurement. Mismeasurement in the sense that Back in the 1940s and 50s, all you had to do was count the number of cars that came off the assembly line. That was easy to measure. Cars, tires, all those things. Now we're doing services, we're doing healthcare, we're doing all kinds of things that are much, much more difficult for the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Bureau of Economic, uh, 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 the BEA, to, to measure. So the thing I'm gonna talk about a little bit is the secular stagnation thing and then the slowdown. Everybody talks about the productivity slowdown that we're just not as productive. And then our wage growth has been very weak, which it has been over about the past decade. So, so why? Why slow? So I have some new research with my graduate students. Leisure on the job has gone up. See, only the people that are laughing know what I mean. Because you're at your desk and you're, you're, you're on Instagram, aren't you? And you're checking the tweets from Megan right? And then you forgot to pay a bill, you decide to buy something, and you're doing that. Now, has that changed very much? In terms, it kind of has gone up. So we can measure that, and we can measure it from something called the American Time Use Survey. And what's the idea? Technology has made us more productive per hour, 
but it's also made it easier to take leisure on the job. And by the way, the, your boss knows this. It's not like you're hiding it. Even though if you go to the NCAA website and you see um, the boss button for the March Madness, it's a little thing you can download that while you're watching the game at your desk, the boss comes by, you hit a button, and a spreadsheet pops up. <laughs> it's on the NCAA website, so it's not like we don't know it. <laughs> but you know, leisure, and leisure overall has gone up in the United States over the past 100 years. The amount of work hours have been falling. And that makes sense. The richer you get, what you want to do is you want to buy better goods, and you want to take a little more leisure. So leisure has been going up over time. And when you think about it, why just leisure at home? Why can't you take a little more leisure at, at work to make it more pleasant? You can go to Google, play ping pong, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, Aerobi, whatever they do, I don't know. Um, but there's actually data on this. It comes from the American Time Use Survey. The American Time Use Survey asks people, thousands of people, what you do with your time. And they do a time diary. And at work, they're very specific about the kinds of things. Like if you're with some employees in a conference meeting, that's not leisure on the job. If you're on Instagram, that is leisure on the job, okay? So we can measure it, which we did. So this is a picture of the occupations that um, take leisure on the job. The higher the bar means the higher fraction, the more probable it is that that occupation takes leisure on the job. So these big ones over here, so this is production over here. So this is uh, transport, materials, and moving. Production is next, you know, maintenance and repair. Those things are big. You know, the small ones are like healthcare, protective services. So these, it's very hard to do it. But what this says is that, you know, it's, you know, 20%, these high numbers up here, 20% of people are taking leisure on the job, basically. Now, so here's what we've done. We've taken those occupations, which are in red, and I call these the high leisure jobs, leisure on the job. Um, and the blue or lower, and now I've just separated them and, and looked at the employment in those, in, this, in those occupations. So what do you see? You see that all of the growth in employment is coming from these high leisure jobs, right? And who doesn't take leisure on the job, for heaven's sakes, you know? But, um, and by the way, the boss could stop it, right? Your firm could put up a firewall. Your firm could take your phone away when you walk in. Believe me, no firm's going to do that. It would cost too much money to hire workers and say, look, when you're here, it's pure drudgery. You know, you can't, you can't be on your phone. You can't, you know, answer your, you know, your kids when they're, they need you. You can't do any of that stuff. That would be too costly in terms of wages. So my view of this is that firms and workers have kind of this implicit bargain that's like, look, as long as you're producing more than you did before because technology is going up, take a little more leisure on the job. That's fine. And now how does that show up in the data? Well, in the data, the Bureau of Labor Statistics comes to ask the boss, how many hours of work did you pay for? And they say eight, because that's how much they paid for in the books. But they know you're only working seven. So now productivity has actually gone up because you're only working seven hours, but producing a little more than you did when you worked more. And that's because of technological change. So this whole notion is we've just mismeasured you know, what's going on with hours and output. So, how much can we explain? You know, not the whole thing, maybe 25%, but you know, we're, kind of, we're, we're getting close. So now I want to talk a little bit about labor market. I told you this is going to be a little bit of an interactive presentation. So here's a quiz. We do these quizzes in school. Um, which president is the jobs creator over the last 50 years, 60 years? And what I mean by jobs creator, take the first four years they've been in office. What president? created the most jobs. Now, I don't show this to my class, by the way, because this is a stupid picture. It's stupid because it's not true. And I'll tell you about more of that in a second, but you guys are smart enough to realize that I'm, what I'm going to tell you. So think about it in your minds. So here's payroll employment during presidential terms. That's Trump. So he's been in office, you know, 17 months or whatever. Um, he's, and, you know, what, what he's done here, he's created about 3% more jobs. That's what he's done. Okay, so who's the best? Let me hear it. Reagan, okay. Obama? There are more presidents than that lately, by the way. Anybody? <laughs> Clinton? It's Jimmy Carter. This is Carter. 
Carter, in his four years, uh, you know, created like, you know, 15% more jobs, roughly. Here's Clinton. This is Clinton. This is Reagan. Reagan went down, and then he comes back up. These guys can't do that. They're not creating jobs. You know what they're doing? They're entering at a good time, or they're entering at a bad time. <laughs> Most of it's not their fault, right? I mean, it's just they came in, and the, the last president screwed things up. Who knows? But this is not, don't think the, I'm not saying the president's created these jobs, okay? That's what this graph says, but that's not what I'm saying. So, no one guesses Carter. I'm just telling you, no one ever guesses Carter. Okay, so now the Fed's in a bit of a conundrum. Why is that? We're getting employment growth. Unemployment's as low as it's ever been, basically, at 3.9%. Um, we have a very tight labor market. I'm going to explain what that is in a second. Uh, and there's, but there's been very little wage growth. And so if you read any of the Fed minutes that come out, now they're kind of talking about this wage growth, that they're, they're going to keep increasing the Fed funds rate, by the way, for, you know, three more times or something this year. Um, but if they're not going to see wages starting to grow, they're going to back off that a little bit, right? So they haven't really seen the wage growth. It's starting to come a little bit. So this is a picture of payroll employment, and this is what I meant um, growing slowly. Again, this, this thicker line here is um, uh, the current cycle coming out of a trough. And again, we're growing very, very slowly. Now, <clears throat> this is what I mean by tight labor markets, what economists think about tight labor markets. So this is a picture of the uh, census regions. And in the blue line is the number of unemployed people. And the red line is the number of jobs that are open that they can take. So what you can see, for example, during the Midwest, you know, what happens during uh, uh, the Great Recession is that the number of people unemployed go up a lot, and the number of vacant jobs go down. That means it's much harder to find a job, right? There's lots of people searching for jobs, and there aren't very many jobs. So if you look at what's happening today, and this is the only region, and this is the only time it's ever happened, basically, is in the Midwest, there are more vacant openings, more vacant jobs than people looking for them. It's kind of the first time it's ever happened, and it's a very tight labor market in the Midwest. And all of these things have been narrowing and getting closer and closer, as you can see. Um, so what that means is that there's about the same number of people unemployed as vacant jobs. During the Great Recession, you know, there were 16 million unemployed people and about five, 4 million jobs. So it's very, very hard, you know, to get a job. So that's kind of what we mean by a, a, a tight labor market. Now I want to move locally and talk about some things locally. And I'm going to tell you that Santa Barbara, in many, many dimensions, is just lagging behind. The GDP data only is up to 2016, but we have labor market data that's up to 2018. So we can sort of see what's been going on, right? So, for example, I'm going to look at education, health services, financial activities, uh, but then I'm going to focus in detail on retail and uh, leisure and hospitality. So this is a picture of employment in education and health services, and the, the, uh, um, the light blue is the United States, the green is Ventura County, the red is San Luis Obispo County, and the um, uh, lighter blue is, uh, the darker blue is Santa Barbara. So what you can see is that, so here's Santa Barbara, right? Here's Santa Barbara, pretty much tracking the US, but we're way below what Ventura and San Luis Obispo were doing. And it's not like they are that different, right? Um, you, you know, so right now, compared to 2000, you know, they're up you know, 80% in terms of employment, whereas you know, we're only up about 50% in terms of employment. So we're growing very, very slowly, and in, 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 even though we're growing in education and health services, not like, our, our neighboring counties. How about fi finance? Finance sucks. I mean, the employment. This is it. This is financial em uh, employment in the financial sector in, in Santa Barbara County. Uh, you can see that in other counties too, Ventura is green, it's been falling. Uh, the US, on the other hand, has been slightly rising. So compared to the other counties and stuff, again, Santa Barbara is kind of doing pretty poorly. Is retail that dead? Um, many people are saying it, right? Everybody thinks of Amazon and they think of all this stuff and there's not going to be a store um, around. It's just not true. This is not true. Retail's not dead. It's changing. Let me show you. So 
almost in every place you find, retail employment is growing. So again, this is Ventura. This is Ventura up here. This is San Luis Obispo. Retail employment's growing. Lately, it's fallen just off a little bit, but both of those are, are, are higher than they were after the Great, uh, Great Recession, as is the U.S., which is here. This is Santa Barbara down here. This is Santa Barbara. We are not back to where we were after the Great, during the Great Recession, and we've been falling in terms of retail employment. So it's not the retail employment sector in the world, it's Santa Barbara that has a problem. So we got to fix that. That's why we're here, right? To fix that problem. Um, so retail employment, not looking good here compared to other places that are, even, that are close to us, that are both growing and, and growing well. These are taxable sales uh, by California County. And again, this, is, this, this light blue one is, uh, is Santa Barbara County. And so what you can see in California, we're kind of at toward the low end. We're almost hardly growing at, at, at all in terms of uh, uh, taxable sales. Uh, this is by city now. So we can see the, the, the highest growth in taxable sales. This is Guadalupe is the highest. This is the city of Santa Barbara, down 1.1% 1 .1 2016. Uh, so my view is 2016 was like a little bit of a mini recession in our county compared to other counties. So it's kind of strange. This is Carpinteria, down 3.5%. Is retail dead? The answer is no. It's not dead. Um, it's lagging here. Um, and you might say, look, State Street's dying. You know, vacancy rates are high. Um, well, not as high as you think. So, so here's what we did. we did. We got a bunch of data from Jim Turner and Steve at the Radius Group. And, uh, my, and our, at the forecast project, what we did was you can take the, the, the addresses and have this program that maps them right into a map, which we did. And so this is what Santa Barbara looked like uh, back in 2013 in the first quarter. And the colors of the dots are uh, rent per square foot for uh, commercial properties, um, retail, et cetera. If it's very red, it's $6 or above. If it's very blue, it's around a dollar something. And so you can see where the um, vacancies are. So these are all the vacant properties uh, uh, downtown. What was the vacancy rate? 1.7% was the vacancy rate um, back in 2013 Q1. 2014, vacancy rate was up to 2.3. And you can start to see where, where things are vacant now. Um, this is 2015. 2016, now we're starting to see a lot of red. It's kind of strange. You're seeing a lot of vacant properties that are very highly priced, right? That's what this is saying um, uh, with all those red dots. And there's our uh, Macy's. That's the eyesore, right? I mean, on this graph, um, right? There's Macy's, that big gray blob there. Uh, Macy's just warps everything, right? 140-some thousand square feet. So when you look at the vacancy rate now compared to last year, uh, in 2016, rather, when it was 1.9%, you just throw Macy's in there, and it jacks up the vacancy rate to 3%. But if you get rid of Macy's, you know, the vacancy rates look about the same as they always have. So it's not like there are a lot more vacant places out there. Um, uh, and now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, zoom in a little bit closer on State Street. So now we sort of are looking closer on State Street. And again, you can see where these uh, vacancies are, you know, um, down on Lower State, uh, East Gutierrez, Haley, et cetera. Uh, not too many expensive properties there, and you don't see very many expensive properties in tw 2013. And now you're going to start to see more and more red. These are expense more expensive vacancies along State Street. Starting to move along out on West Carrillo, et cetera. And there's Macy's again, uh, as you see. And and now sort of a lot more red dots. So, you know, one thing you have to think about is, you know, if things are vacant, why aren't the rents falling? You know, maybe people are just holding out, you know, wanting to get higher rents. But typically what you would see is these, you know, the rents would fall a little bit um, to fill this. But again, the vacancy rates aren't that much different than they had been, you know, once you remove Macy's. So here's the problem. I, you know, th there aren't too many stores. That is, they're not going to be dying. We just have the wrong stores. You know, people are moving, you know, many of these malls now are getting people to come in to do entertainment, to do, have salons, to do all these different things that are service related, not just going into a big box store to buy stuff. That part's going to be going away. We have to transition. 
That's what the problem with, with State Street is we just haven't transitioned yet. It's not that retail's dying. We're going to start seeing changing financing structures. We're not going to see long leases, you know, 20 year leases and stuff like that. We're going to start seeing maybe some pop up kinds of leases. You have a lease for a year or six months or something like that. Go in and try it. So, all these things are happening in, in, in the rest of the world. There is one little caveat here that I want to give you, though, is that um, there's a downside here. And what's been happening, and it's kind of under the, under the radar, is that because of the low interest rates and easy financing a, a while back, um, many of these businesses that should have gone out of business were able to hang on by borrowing cheap. And now if you look at some of these bonds that are coming due, these coming, they're maturing, um, they're starting to mature now, these high-risk bonds. So in 2018, there's going to be 1.9 billion of high-risk bonds coming due. And these people, most of them are hurting. So that's going to be troublesome. And then after that, it's going to be five billion a year for the next five or six years of these high-risk bonds maturing. So that could be a little bit of a financial crisis in that sector. So you know, that's something to sort of, you, know, you want to look out for. So I want to move to sort of talk about leisure and hospitality. Again, a big topic here in Santa Barbara. Um, so this is leisure and hospitality employment. And the blue, you know, Santa Barbara, so we're doing pretty well, relatively, uh, uh, sorry, this is Santa Barbara here. We're doing well in terms of growth, but, you know, we're not growing as much as some of these other places have been growing, like um, San Luis Obispo uh, and Ventura that are both up here, right? So, again, we're growing, but we're kind of lagging behind, you know, some of our, uh, uh, some of our localities. These are, the, uh, these are hotel room daily rates going over the years. Uh, the high ones are the beach resorts, closer to the beach, and you can see the daily rates up around 300. Um, and then you go down into North County, you know, which are closer to 125, something like that. But these things have been growing, they're stable, um, you know, so that, that part of the leisure and hospitality is looking fine. The supply of hotel rooms has been changing a lot. Um, we know in Goleta, as you've seen, Goleta has been, you know, increasing uh, their hotel space a lot. So a lot of additional supply in hotel rooms outside, out in Goleta. For many years, no one was really doing much, you know, going along here. Uh, we're starting to see a little bit more building going on, so we're starting to see more hotels. Uh, occupancy rates? Well, occupancy rates have always been pretty high. Um, this is downtown. The higher red one is downtown. Uh, um, Goleta is, this, is, this, is, is the green. And again, up 80, above 80%. But as I just mentioned, the supply has now gone up. The supply has gone up, which means vacancy rates are going to, occupancy rates are going to fall a little bit as we have greater supply, and hopefully they're going to be filled over time. This is one of our favorite graphs, by the way. It's so ugly. Um, this is transient occupancy tax for 2017, um, uh, uh, in 2017 dollars. And what you can see here is it's really spiky, right? Because it's very seasonal. The high pe these peaks up here are July. These are all July. So we peak sort of in, in the occupancy tax in July. It falls a lot in, down into December. Uh, and it just repeats that pattern over and over again. And what you can see basically is that um, you know, the tax rate, the taxes have been going up in, in real dollars. Right? So we've been seeing that. And lately, it's kind of flattened out. But we're having sort of increase, which means more and more people are showing up here in Santa Barbara, obviously. This is the growth rate in the occupancy tax. And here you can really see something startling. What you see is um, you can see the fires very clearly, and you can see the, uh, the debris flow. So you can see this exactly as you look on the far, uh, far right out, out into 2017. You can actually see it coming out in the transient occupancy tax. And the thing we did at the Libero Theater, you know, we talked to uh, uh, some of the county representatives and city, um, and th you know, they say it's coming in fine now, um, so not something to be too worried about, but it's something you can see pretty clearly. So some final thoughts. Um, the economy's trudging forward. Like I said, we're growing slowly. Maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe when you have these really high growth rates, you do, kinds of, you do stuff and then you crash. Maybe now we're, we're growing slowly. Housing prices are growing you know, roughly 3 to 5%, which is pretty much standard. I showed you the picture about real returns to, to capital. It grows about the same as housing. So that seems pretty good. The problem is that Santa Barbara is lagging in lots of areas, both employment and GDP. I told you this little kind of mini recession in 2016. We don't have the data for 2017 and 2018. But, you know, we're looking a lot different than, than Ventura and uh, San Luis Obispo. 
My guess is that retail is going to pick up speed um, once we start doing some of these transitions. Uh, so hopefully politicians here will realize we need to sort of do the stuff that, we, uh, that these other places are doing to, to revitalize our downtown. And yes, there will be a recession. I don't know when. <laughs> no one knows when. So, you know, but, you know, it's, we will. Um, so anyway, um, that's all I have for today.